Uh, Bob Howard, who is a professor at Cornell University. He also, as you can see in his bio and the seminar program, has a lot of experience working with the aftermath of oil spill since he was the chief scientist um, consulting with the Attorney General of the state of Alaska on the heels of the Exxon Valdez spill. Patty Parson is a managing producer for PBS NewsHour, which has done a phenomenal job of covering this spill so far, and she will be talking about this from the perspective of a TV newswoman. This has obviously been a very visual story, and now that the the really phenomenal visuals are going away, what does this mean for what we're going to see in the coming months? Um, Peter Kovacs is on her right. He is the managing editor for the Times Picayune, New Orleans, which obviously has been very interested in the story since it is right in their backyard. And they have a, a very committed environmental reporting team there. So he will have a lot to offer this conversation. And finally, of course, our winner of the 2010 Grand Prix Prize, Alana Mitchell, whom you've already heard from, um, about her book is now going to offer some insights about how this story has been covered um, from her perspective as an author and a longtime journalist. And finally, I want to introduce Amy Mitchell, who is moderating our panel today. Amy is the Deputy Director of the Pew Research Center's Project for Excellence in Journalism, based in Washington. The Project for Excellence in Journalism is a fantastic resource. I suggest that you check it out when you can. They do reports on the state of the news media and, in fact, have an annual report, the state of the news media, that is a, a great one-stop source for all of, well, I would say all the news that's fit to print, but really what's happening in the news industry at a given time. So with that, I welcome Amy Mitchell to the stage. Thank you. Um, along for the rest of the afternoon, although I feel that there is so much energy and knowledge in this room that there will, um, I will have a small role uh, in terms of uh, figuring out what people have to say here. Um, and I've been asked to just start off with a few um, PowerPoint slides, sorry, on um, what uh, we did a study on the coverage of the first 100 days, so sort of what the media was able to do, what they didn't do, and then be able to hear from the perspective um, of Bob on, um, from a scientific perspective, of what maybe were some areas that they missed, and then we will get into um, some discussion among the panelists, and then lots of discussion with you all, the questions that, that you have as well. Uh, so first of all, when we think about um, coverage of the oil spill and the story of the oil spill, um, this, obviously, after this morning's discussion, is a very small piece of the pie of what's happening in um, the area of environment and science in our world. Um, but it is also an event. Uh, it was an event, um, a piece of news, and, it's, it, and it is often the way news works uh, in our society. And that's, again, part of what we'll be talking about today. And in covering this event, uh, this disaster, there were lots of differences. Um, in the way it unfolded and the elements of it, then uh, many of the disasters that the press is used to covering that pose some significant, ch significant challenges um, to how they do their job. Um, it, so it was a different kind of disaster. And rather than a one-time event, like an earthquake, a hurricane, something that causes a lot of de a devastation immediately, a, a killing at a college university, this was a long-running, slow-motion kind of story that unfolded over the course of time and required constant vigilance, which just in a practical sense is a huge drain on any new outlet. To be able to cover something like that over a long period of time, both in personnel and in monetary resources. Uh, it had multiple storylines um, that were actually even in three geographically different places. We had the London-based PP, um, you know, the owner of the rig. We had the um, events on the ground, what was happening. Um, at the place, and we had the work of the Obama administration and their efforts to have some response to it. So the media being forced to cover this um, day in and day out at several different levels in three different places, uh, and also in a very technical story. There's lots of complexities to it, and as we'll talk about more in here from Bob, um, a lot of scientific knowledge that is hard to relate um, to the general public in a way that um, explains to them what's happening and also gets to the, to the, to the nitty-gritty of what's happening at a scientific level. Um, so we wanted to ask, how did the press do in this job? Um, so we studied the first 100 days across a lot of different media, and we found, by and large, ooh, this is going on top of it. 
um, that um, it got a lot of coverage. The press gave it a very significant amount of attention. Um, it was by far the dominant story. It accounted for 22% of the entire news hole that we look at, which is 52 different kind of outlets um, across the course of this period. It was almost double uh, what the coverage of the economic crisis got during this time. Uh, so another element was that it got sustained coverage. The media didn't cover it once uh, for one week or two weeks or three weeks and then walk away. In the 14 full weeks that were included in this study, the disaster finished among the top three <coughs> weekly stories 14 times. Uh, it never went below the third story on any given week uh, during the course of this first 100 days. It registered as the number one story in what we monitored nine weeks out of those 14. Uh, if you think about some other events as they're covered, um, the earthquake in Haiti that was the top five stories for four weeks <coughs> then dropped down to less than 3% of the news hole after that, never came back up again. Uh, the minor um, disaster in the, in the West Virginia coal mine accident, the first week, several percent of the coverage, by the next week it was down to 3%. So in most cases, the media cannot, it, it does not, um, for, for multiple reasons, uh, provide this kind of sustained attention that they were able to do for the Gulf oil spill. It also had a very significant amount of public interest. And it's interesting when we um, uh, think about the numbers that were mentioned earlier um, in the session about the lack of interest the public shows in environment, uh, environmental issues, and scientific concerns. Uh, this particular event had huge amounts of interest. And a lot of that comes down to that it was an event driven, something people could watch, people could follow, um, they were trying to figure out the impact on it, they were glued to it. And just like the media coverage didn't go away, the public interest didn't go away either. It saves, it, and even bumped back up towards the end of the 100 days. And even as of a few weeks ago, still had dropped low. People are very engaged in this story. Um, so that's something we'll want to talk about later on when we ask, okay, how can we make these kinds of things interesting to the public? How can we figure out a way to engage them in the broader stories of what's happening with our environment? Uh, and with science in general. According to the surveys by the uh, uh, Pew Research Center of People in the Press, 50 to 60 percent said that they were following the story very closely during these uh, first 100 days. So if we look at what kind of storylines uh, got coverage, um, when we said that there were kind of three main areas, and I would say there's a fourth area, which is what the oil spill represents for the bigger implications of the environment. Uh, the media did not get caught up in the Washington story as much as it often does uh, with many of the other things that it, that it covers. Um, the biggest area of attention were the, was the environmental and the business impact, the cleanup, the containment, the actual practicalities of what was going to happen because of this spill uh, as a result of this spill. They then looked at corporate responsibilities and the government's role um, was, the, was the third largest area of coverage. But they stayed pretty broad paced. And when you look at it across even the different media sectors from newspapers to cables, even the cable industry was not all about the blame game. There was a lot about what's happening and what does this mean. So it's keeping a pretty broad perspective. <coughs> it was definitely a story for um, uh, visual appeal. Cable and network news both giving it um, the, the most amount of coverage across any of the sectors that we look at. Um, newspapers sort of stood out in there. And, the, and newspapers, I should say, this is just front page coverage um, of newspapers, which is an important point to make. Um, and a lot of front page coverage um, at, at the national level focused on BP and the impact and the role of BP uh, in this uh, coverage as well, whereas cable and network was a little bit more diverse. Um, and at this, we were looking at national press, so the wonderful work of the Times picking in is not in this study, so they're not reflected here, I should mention. <laughs> Um, another area that we wanted to look at was, okay, what could they do on the web? Because there certainly are a lot of challenges and limitations to what um, somebody can offer, a news outlet can offer in their 30-minute um, newscast or the front page of their newspaper to a general audience. So how are they able to make use of the web to be able to offer different layers of knowledge, to be able to tell the story in different ways, to bring in more scientific elements? Um, and we did see um, a lot of interactive features in, that were used pretty effectively to get at um, the complexities of the story. And this is one that PBS um, has had. They had the oil leak widget, which they then made available um, to any other place that wanted to link to it, I'm, I'm pretty certain, right? And it's something we'll ask Patty to talk about you know, a little bit later in terms of what they're able to um, 
uh, 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 to, to tell with this. We also have um, the New York Times, which did several video animated things where they tried to be able to show people um, sort of the ins and outs of how uh, they were trying to get into the, to the um, different rigs and the approaches that we were taking. And uh, CNN had several elements as well where they tried again to get to um, a lot more sort of the scientific levels of what's happening. And if you drill down into these things, um, you'll see that you get to a point where you had to have a pretty good knowledge of what was happening to be able to follow some of the graphics, which I think is a sign that um, you're able to push the envelope a little bit more on the web than you can in some of your legacy publications because the user can decide how much of this they want to digest and how much they want to um, uh, be able to, uh, how deep they want to go in the story. Uh, so keep this short. Um, these are hopefully going to be uh, some of the areas that we can talk about with the panel a little bit. Um, and overall, you know, we saw that uh, the media, at least when it comes to uh, giving the general public knowledge, was able to stay on top of the story, um, to give a continued significant amount of coverage, um, and, uh, and offer various levels of, uh, of the storyline in terms of what was happening. And um, one of the questions is how successful they were from a scientific perspective in terms of uh, bringing the big issues to light. And then being able to use this to um, expand the conversation that goes on in the news media about what's happening in our environment and, and in our world. And so we'll just ask uh, Bob to give a few uh, thoughts. He's got some slides as well from a scientific perspective, and then we'll have questions with the panel today. Thank you very much. It's really a distinct honor to, to be here today. I'm very much uh, appreciate what the Redcap Institute does. Uh, I think getting uh, uh, quality environmental information to the public is one of the most critical challenges our society faces. So. Uh, I was asked to talk from the perspective of a scientist in terms of how we view uh, what, uh, how the press coverage is still. Just a tiny bit of background. Uh, I'm an environmental scientist. I work on a large range of different issues. Uh, I haven't actually worked on oil pollution personally for almost 20 years since the time of Exxon Valdez. In part, the point was made earlier that the sort of chronic leakage off of city streets from the air is bigger than the Exxon Valdez as an assault to the environment. That's exactly right. And knowing that from 20 years ago and all the other insults I've been putting my effort in elsewhere. But I have worked on oil going back to the 1970s. And I studied that uh, spill off of Cape Cod there in 76, and as mentioned earlier, I was the chief consultant for the state of Alaska on the Exxon Valdez spill, trying to make sure it was good quality control behind the experimental uh, entities that hold up in court. And I was the person who interpreted those for the lawyers and for the politicians. So that's my background here. What can I say about this spill? Again, I didn't work on this spill, but I have a lot of colleagues and friends who are working on it, have been working on it. Uh, what I want to say, though, is that there's sort of a uh, fundamental mismatch in the timing of science and in the needs of reporters and how it's done. We don't know what the environmental impacts of that spill are yet. We can guess from previous spills that there'd be major damage. You'd expect a lot of oil in the sediments. You'd expect that to persist a long time. We'd expect sensitive fish eggs to be affected. We'd also expect that it's going to take five, ten years to really fully ascertain that. And but that doesn't, of course, work in terms of how we report it. But what, what can we learn? What can we say from previous spills? And, and I'm going to highlight here two things that I don't think the press did a very good job on. Uh, one, one is the cleanup. Now, cleanup of oil spills is a misnomer. I have a spill over there, the Zasa spill, 1977. It's in the Stockholm archipelago, where two-thirds of the oil was cleaned up. That's the only spill in the entire history of oil spills since the 1940s where more than 10% of the oil has been spilled up. One is the norm for most spills, and one is, in fact, what we see from the Gulf oil spill. So all this activity, all these skimmer boats, have got a huge amount of press attention, the guys out there cleaning stuff up on the beach. You know, it's public relations. It's not really clean. And we knew that going in from a lot of previous spills. We also knew very early on in this spill that it was significantly bigger than either the government or BP was saying. And we know that because on average, when you spill oil, it spreads out, and you get an average of about a square mile a second for every 10 barrels spilled. A little bit of variance in that, but not a huge amount. So three days into the spill, you can look at the satellite imagery here, and you can go, aha, you know? It's got to be around 18,000 barrels a day that's being spilled. 
At that time, the BP and the government were saying 1,000 barrels. And after I talked to the BBC about this, the government said, well, maybe it's 5,000 barrels. So it was a long time before the estimates went up further than that. But in fact, we knew very early on it was a bigger spill. And in fact, it was about twice as large as I was thinking a few days after it started, because a lot of the oil never reached the surface and didn't contribute to the slick. But I don't think the press did a terribly good job of putting that either. Now, what can we say about the effects? Well, <coughs> some of the oil got into the marshes. Uh, luckily, not as much as, as uh, one might have, have feared. Uh, oil in marshes is a really bad thing. There was a small spill over in Cape Cod back in 1969. Some of the oil got into a marsh. That oil is still in that marsh. Now, here, it's warmer in the Gulf. It won't hang around as long, so it may not be a 40-year problem. It might be a 20-year problem, but it's a long-range problem with toxic levels and ecological effects. But what are the other big questions? And I think these are still open questions. That's why I'm not showing you data or giving you conclusions because the science is ongoing and it's a slow process. But how much of that oil is still in the water and in what forms, we don't know. There are people out there today doing surveys. Uh, they're taking analyses. They take it back to the lab. It's a difficult analysis. It takes months to get the data back. So we don't entirely know. Did the dispersants help or aggravate? We don't know. This is an unprecedented level of dispersants for a spill that's occurring at an unprecedented deep level. The spill behaved very strangely, but is it the depth that did it or the dispersants? I'm not sure we'll ever know that one. How much oil is in the bottom sediments? Uh, my friend and colleague Mandy Joy from the University of Georgia is getting some compelling data that there's a ton of it in the bottom sediments, uh, but that's fairly controversial. Not all of her friends and our colleagues believe that yet that's going on. I think it's going to take a couple of years to resolve that debate. What are the effects of that? Well, to me, the most sensitive organisms would be the bottom, deep, deep corals, things like that. As far as I know, those haven't yet been surveyed. Uh, it'll be a while before we have a sense of what the damage is. What about fish? Well, you know, adult fish are pretty, pretty damn hardy when it comes to oil pollution. We know that from other spills. The worry is fish eggs, fish larvae, the young, young, young stages. And here, uh, you really have to look at the population development over time to ascertain our effects. The Exxon Valdez spill, it took us a solid 10 years to figure out what the damage to the fisheries was, and it was substantial. It's going to take us this sort of time to figure out what went on the Gulf as well. Now, I want to shift just a little bit. Well, yeah, that's, I, I had to do this. My, my daughter is a freshman in high school, helped me pull this together. <laughs> These are pictures. So, short, short quiz. These are five pictures of, of offshore oil rig. Uh, disasters. And the question is, do you think these are all the, the BP spill, or do I, am I showing you other things? Quick, quick show. How many think it's all this most recent accident? Fish talk at the bottom. No, it's not it, but I'll give you the answer here. One of fish. Those two, I don't have it, but these are all fairly recent things. Those two are just different versions of the, of the BP Gulf spill there, most recent one. This I one, so. I have hardly ever shown this to someone who, uh, who recognizes it. This is a big spill that happened off of Australia less than a year ago. Uh, it spilled almost as much oil as Exxon Valdez, which makes it a lot smaller than this BP accident. But it's a big spill. And I don't believe it was ever reported in the US press. Uh, I never saw our program. OK, good. The thank world, you. World Radio International. OK, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And it was well reported in Australia, which is how I thought it was. <laughs> it's less than a year ago, you know, and then the president is going on in the spring, and there's, there's no problems with this technology. And it wasn't a surprise to most of us that, you know, things still happen. The size is really surprising. And then that guy there, that happened in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, that was reported in the New York Times and, and elsewhere, but didn't get a lot of attention. And the difference between this, this is another BP rig. The difference between that one three years ago and this one is that they had pretty good luck, and it didn't go into a worse accident. Whereas with the most recent accident, they had pretty bad luck and a series of cascading errors and it became a disaster. But I point this out that you know, I don't think that the average person, the average American, uh, recognizes that the accidents are happening all of the time. This is risky business. Now I want to end up with one other point, moving back from oil, and just tying it into the bigger picture of national energy policy and how, how we scientists think about it and the sort of mismatch I phrase this in terms of, you know, can, can, can there be a more proactive element of getting information out to the public? And I know it's hard because the public's not very interested in these issues, but let me give you two that are close to my own heart. One is the development of shale gas, which is progressing all over the place now. 
uh, is sold as something that's a clean transitional fuel. Uh, whoops. Uh, is it or is it not? Uh, I have my own personal view. I can talk later if people are interested in it. The other is biofuels. And I work a lot on biofuels. I'm a chief advisor to the United Nations on that. Uh, are biofuels a clean way? Are they a good way forward? Uh, and is cellulosic ethanol really better, the way that most people in our society think? Uh, I don't believe so. In fact, most scientists don't think so. And to, to back that up, let me show you this letter. This was written by a group called the Council of Scientific Society Presidents. It's an umbrella group that represents 1.4 million scientists in the United States from 150 different disciplines. Now, we wrote this letter to Obama and senior administration officials back in the spring saying that global change is a real threat. Society has to take this more seriously. We have to move <coughs> aggressively on this. But, but we better be very careful how we do so and that some of these solutions which are being used or suggested may be more damaging than they are good. And the two examples that we used in this group were ethanol from corn and the natural gas from the shale farm. Both of which may actually aggravate global warming as opposed to help in any way. Now, you know, the scientific community thinks this strongly. To get that large of a science body to agree on that and send it to the president is a remarkable thing. And yet, somehow this information is not getting out to the public, which means we as scientists are doing a lousy job in reaching the press and getting that message out. I'll, I'll end with that. I'm really, uh, to say, I'm very pleased to be here today as part of this discussion. Thank you.
and um, the non-scientific aspect of what I was doing. And about two-thirds were online. And we did the dispersion story several times. We did microbial action. We did the, um, the plume, the impact on seafood. And that just led us to talk. I mean, we could not have done that without scientists that were willing to talk to us, to scientists that were willing to be truthful about, well, I don't agree with that person for this, and so that we could seek a balance of, of what we were hearing from people. Um, we went out on boats continually with scientists, and we also, we had trouble since we didn't have enough staff to go on the longer vessel cruises, so we have, on the Weatherbird too, we have one of our HDV cameras, so the scientists could shoot what they were uh, what they were seeing and get that information back to us. Um, so that all was incredibly helpful. But there were two, two or three two challenges <laughs> to working uh, with a scientist. And one is the usual one is, is the language. The, the language and the understanding and the amount of detail necessary. And I know scientists probably think we dumb down things a lot. And, and we try to do that with still having respect for what the scientists are trying to say but also for, for our audience to understand it. Because it goes by really fast on air, and you have to keep underlining and explaining things, which is one advantage of online. Because we could use our online to, to put in more graphics, and we put in more articles about it. But um, usually when I, I've been doing, let's head of our science unit for about six years under NSF grants, and you know, you can spend a lot of time really understanding the science before you talk to the scientist, and then when you talk to the scientist, you can understand it in order to explain it to the layperson or to say, could you translate it this way? Um, and our my producing correspondents in the field are very good at that. On, on the Pulseville, especially in the beginning, we're doing daily stories, and they'd say, okay, I'm going on a boat, I'm going to the marsh, oh, the weather's bad. Oh, and, and it's, it was constantly having to say that, find something, find something else. And so it was really kind of seat of the pants in a lot of our reporting, and hopefully we we're getting it right, but I, we're getting snapshots snapshots along the way, which is why several of the stories we've returned to, like this person's, as it got more controversial, like the impact on seafood, which we want to go back and look at the eggs in the last generation, and those kind of stories. So that was, that's always been, you know, we have to say, that, okay, you can put in your grant proposal, then think of logic, but please don't put it in your bites, because my boss will just cut the bite out. <laughs> it's just for work. Um, and the other thing was a huge different sense of deadline from science, scientists and, journalists, and daily journalists. Um, I mean, a lot of them were very responsive and said, okay, I'll go to the boat with you, I'll go do this. Um, but others that we've talked to, I think they really want to wait till they publish. And I'm saying, you know, just let us go and we want to see the process. If you're going scooping up sand, if you're getting a canister of air, if in your lab you're looking in a microscope, you want to see it. I think, I think there's three problems. I think they want to wait till they know what they've got. I think they don't think what they do is very interesting or seen it. Oh, we're just going down the beach. Oh, we're just looking, you know, and you, you try to persuade them. And I think also because we eventually, you know, talk about it later, got an NSF graphic grant, as did a lot of these people. And I think when I say we have NSF, and they think NSF is fine, I think in some way. I really do think it was, because I, you know, I wrote to a huge number of people that got NSF graphic grants, and no one would respond, or they'd say, yeah, well, so it's very frustrating not to be able to, to get this. I know they have a sense of urgency about the science they're doing, but also to have them be part of the story. And I just think that science communication and talking to the press would be extremely helpful. Because it would really let us see the nuances that we were not seeing. You know, we may get an Ed Overton that will go out of that kind of notice, but other kinds of people won't. And, and so I really, that would be very useful. So, um, and I also do, just have to thank NOLA.com for since Katrina, I mean, this is our daily reading Bible because I think it's not to, told us not only what was important, but what the impact on the people. So, Alana, how do you how do we bridge the gap between the language of the scientist and the language of um, the lay reader, and then the story that needs to be told in a very condensed version on a daily basis, as opposed to a wonderful book or a documentary where you can take months to do the work. No, this is, this is the great challenge, and, and of course, what, what you're also dealing with is journalists who usually don't have a basic knowledge of science. I mean, most, you know, most journalists don't have any science. Like I have no science background, but most can't read a scientific paper. They don't. It's not just that they don't know how to translate what they hear from scientists into something that their audiences can, can understand. It's that they don't know enough to ask the right questions. 
And, and one of the things that I think would help with this is that it's really, really, I always found it was very, very difficult to talk to scientists about implications. So one of the questions that, as a journalist, as a daily journalist, one of the things I kept asking scientists about, you know, the was they all blow out, was, you know, what are the implications of this? And of course, it's too early to know that, but in the whole context of reporting on this stuff, it's, it's incredibly important to, uh, for the journalist to be able to know to ask the questions in order to then condense it. And that's one of the steps that, I, you know, I, I found really amazing. I, I did a bunch of interviews in the States because I had written a season, I did a bunch of interviews with the media outlets there was almost this level of hysteria about, uh, oh, our drinking water is now all gone. You know, uh, <coughs> complete, complete and utter, um, a profound level of ignorance just in general. And we're not talking about the PBS and some of the things that have been We're talking about, you know, online radio shows and, and talk shows and things like that. But it was, uh, these are things that have quite a broad reach. So with this one too, you know, there was just sort of getting people through the basic the absolute basic knowledge about what was happening, that there is drilling at that level, and that is basically that the consequences of it are unknown scientifically. Mm -hmm. That when you have a big blow of like this, you cannot know what the impacts are. And, and moving through that to get to some of the that people can actually understand. But I would say, speaking of uh, implications, I mean, at, at the local level, um, you know, you're seeing implications right in front of your eyes sure. you know, every day, and people that are losing their jobs, the, the economy that's happening. Um, and so, so, Peter, from your perspective, at sort of the local level and being the main local news source, um, uh, what were some of the experiences you had in, in being able to try to address the great concerns and needs of your local public and also tell the scientific story? Um, well, you know, uh, I want to agree with everyone because I always felt like, um, you know, journalists are kind of a self-selected group of people who, like, all got C's in biology. <laughs> That's why they became journalists. <laughs> Science. And, and exhibit A of that is the inability of the media to cover climate change and, and the way in which the media covers climate change by, you know, the same way they cover politics, by just quoting one person who agrees and another person who disagrees. Um, and that's, uh, that speaks to the importance of, of the Metcalf Institute and, and, and we should all have gratitude for the Grantham Foundation um, for anything that can be done to help journalists cover and learn science. Um, you know, what I found was that, that we had good cooperation from, from local scientists who tended to understand Louisiana, uh, but most of the, well, I shouldn't say most, much of the attention nationally was really not on the best or smartest scientists, but kind of on the scientists who had the simplest theories or the most sensational theories. Um, and there are consequences to this, and I'll give you an example. Of, you know, I was talking to Ken Feinberg this week, and, um, and he was saying that really the biggest tension in the work he's doing allocating the, the BP money is between Louisiana and Florida, who are in a way rivals over control of the Gulf in a larger sense. Um, and an example of this is, is one of the stories that got an enormous amount of attention was this theory that the oil was going to be swept up in something called a loop current and that the loop current was going to wash the oil ashore in South Beach. And I don't know if that was good science or bad science. It didn't happen, which doesn't mean it was bad science. It just means it, it didn't happen. Um, and, but it did get a lot of attention. And the effect of that, according to Feinberg right now, is that you know, Florida's view is that the, the claims facility should cover losses to properties that lost business to the perception that there might be oil. <laughs> which is not, not, an invalid, not an invalid point. Um, and that, therefore, you know, properties as far as Miami Beach would, in theory, have a claim based on, on some business loss that would not have occurred if there wasn't an oil spill. Um, and that's, you know, as someone from the rival state, I can see that point. Um, you know, uh, Louisiana's point of view is that you know, we're not letting those people get into our 20 billion and that the 20 billion ought to go to cover people who had real damage and lost their entire livelihoods. And that's a valid point too. But it, this tension starts with weak coverage of science. Just to respond to, to a couple of the science points on the, on the loop current, for instance, uh, 
you know, my sense is that the science behind that was pretty good. It was a reasonable expectation that it might have happened. The scientists who put that forward were moderately careful on how they put it forward. The loop current was weaker this year than most, so in some ways we're lucky. Uh, but that goes to the general ethics of our field of scientists is that we don't, we, we publish, and then, and then we talk. Yeah. And that's drilled into us. And if you don't do that, if you talk about your preliminary findings, you, you're vulnerable, you're very vulnerable. So, for instance, the, the folks who put out the loop current idea, and I think it was a responsible thing for them to do because it was a real probability, but there are plenty of, of colleagues of mine who say that was irresponsible because you should have published it first. Well, publication under the best of circumstances, and I'm a journal editor, it takes five to 12 months to publish. And so there needs to be some more time in the way that we, the science community, need to figure out some <coughs> peer process that's faster than that. But the, the fundamental problem is that the science behind this is difficult. You know, I have a, a good friend, good colleague, excellent scientist who did some, uh, some of the early work on uh, oxygen in the, from the Gulf spill. And uh, I think they clearly made some mistakes. Uh, they got out in the... Is this in, Joy? Yeah. 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 Uh, and I, you know, I, I understand uh, she's an excellent scientist. And I think she was acting responsibly in trying to get the information out. Again, a lot of people do not think so. And I, at this point, think she was wrong in her conclusions as well. You know, we scientists make mistakes. We make mistakes all of the time because research is a hugely uncertain thing. Most of what we do, most of the time, is wrong. And that's why you see this natural hesitation, particularly with good scientists. You know, if we knew how to do it, it's not research. You know, we're always doing something that's not, you know? And that's why we believe in the purest review system. Let our friends catch our errors before they're out there in the public, you know? And so this really tests the scientific process as well. One of the um, things we've seen at a broader level in the news industry, is not just at the science level, but is the um, vanishing of the beat reporter of a reporter that stays on a story um, and covers the health industry or the education industry or the science industry. <clears throat> and that's their job, is to know that and to be looking into it and studying it day in and day out. And they're not going to have a, a piece in the paper or, or on their news segment every night about that, but they're always following it up. And by giving, and in the, as the dynamics of the news industry and the economy in the news industry changed a lot, um, one of the things to go was a lot of the reporters. You don't notice on the bylines, mostly everybody's a staff reporter for the most part. Um, and so not having somebody um, that knows something about what's happened before they go into coverage um, has had a huge impact on the depth, the breadth of coverage in a lot of different areas um, beyond, just, uh, beyond just science. Um, and one of the ways that um, when we talk about sort of the web and you know, the possibilities, of, of, um, possibilities that, that come there, are the ability to link to other places um, that might have deep information, um, to be able to give your users and your readers that really care about these issues um, a, a lot of opportunity to go do their own um, further research and dig further if they want to. Uh, one of the things that Google has done is start a, a page called Google Labs, and people are familiar with it, where they actually do subject-based um, uh, reporting so that there was a, one of the ones that they did in their experimental lab period was on uh, global warming. And it was either with New York Times or the Washington Post reporters, I can't remember which. And they had a whole page, it was like a front page, that was designated to global warming. And it had all levels of knowledge there, from you know, the latest daily news event that might have happened to a timeline that went four decades long, to um, uh, public speeches that people had given, to things from the G2 summit, you know, a lot of different levels. And so the way people approach news now is often by subject or topic rather than by outlet. Um, and so to be able to give people um, something online where they can then decide for themselves to get to the raw data if they want to, um, to look at a lot of scientific language if they want to, to try to parse through that. So I'm curious to know um, what uh, the news organizations have done. You know, on some of their web work, they were able to hook up with um, scientific organizations or offer things in depth um, that, uh, that allow their readers to get sort of the level of knowledge that they might have been interested in. Okay. Um, our, our, our web uh, really took off on us. I mean, it was we were just getting our website up and not just up and running, but really exploding what we were doing on the web. And um, they paid. We had this, we still have a whole oil page that just 
they just had a lot of reporters, including a, a, a woman who had been focused on modern science reporting, and then became a health reporter, so, so with that, and, and doing a lot of articles, and just really trying to interpret it for the graphics, and it's been, that's been extremely helpful. I mean, and we are, I can't say the luxurious because we're broke, but we really have the opposite direction, we have peace. And we just hired a new science correspondent, Miles O'Brien, from CNN. And we uh, made someone else a better science web, web person so that we were really going to have um, more control over of what goes on. I do think since we had the same people in the Gulf uh, month after month and the same cameraman, I mean, they knew they were really in depth about that. But I really think that in terms of, of the web, the thing is, is the links and what you link to and who links to you and just to get people that they can go through stages depending on how deep they want to go. And are there certain scientific outlets, you know, other than Noah and some of the others that um, really you felt could tell a story um, and, and additional research in the way that your readers uh, well, I mean, we link, we link to NSF and, and we link to a lot of the government agencies and the Coast Guard mm -hmm. and things. And, and when there's hearings, we um, have people come in and, and make comments to the hearings, uh, so they bring that perspective and then link to their websites, um, scientists and uh, political observers and everything else, all the way up there. And I don't have the bank to in yeah, And I'd say our, our best links every day were back, I don't know if you remember the NOAA oil spill maps, yeah, yeah, yeah. the three day forward looking yeah. oil spill maps. I don't know if those were all that accurate, but they, they put them out there every day. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, they were interesting. and those were our top links mm -hmm. every day for, you know, for the middle portion of the economy well still. And that was useful stuff because um, uh, the thing, you know, uh, putting stuff online, is, putting good stuff online is pretty labor intensive. And I'm glad to hear, I didn't know who was doing this, I'm glad to hear they're doing it. Um, because, you know, the results of normal Google, if you want to understand the value of the results of normal Google searches, Google search yourself and see the assortment of stuff that comes up on you, and then try to figure out if you were trying to understand you, whether you'd actually be able to figure yourself out. <laughs> I, should, I should point out, it's actually a news layout page that's open source, and any news organization or outlet can use that uh, to you know, help tell their, their story through their news outlet if they wanted to. Um, yeah. I just want to say one thing. We were talking about engagement before, is that we did with Google. Um, the PBS News Hour has its own YouTube channel uh, that started this year. And with Google, we put out a question there of how you would solve the oil spill. And so you get these amateur scientists, and, and it's just, we got really inundated. Things that would make Bob cringe. <laughs> tens of thousands of ideas. We did have scientists on to say what was, you know, impractical, but people were engaged with this issue. They, you know what I mean? And they didn't feel it was a hopeless thing. Well, I think that gets at the question of how do you engage the public on a longer term basis um, for when the implications actually happen, um, you know, months and months and years down the road, and how um, do you, are you able to keep this a story that people come back to if they're interested in the economy and they're interested in, um, you know, other areas that are affected by the things that happen here. How do you, as a role of a journalist, and the job of a journalist, right, is to be able to make what happens interesting, right? To learn how to tell a story about what the boring, make the boring interesting, as they say. Um, what are ways you can do that? I mean, it's it's a huge drain on resources, and I'm curious to know how many reporters you had to pull off other beats to cover this. Um, <coughs> days with both of you, but but how do we tell that story? Plenty of work, <laughs> and now it's political season. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, the yeah, I mean, we, we didn't have that problem because it was, um, it wasn't this, we didn't have as many competing values in terms of the attention of our staff and our readers, you know, mm -hmm. during that period. Mm -hmm. So you could pretty much use your whole staff on the story. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we didn't have, uh, you know, we didn't have the issue of how are we going to cover the Haitian earthquake and the oil spill. But, uh, Elaine, you've got to have your wheels turning here. question here. How do you how do you use something like this to really move conversation forward? I mean that, that to me is the, is, the, is the ultimate question. Because of course there are all sorts of things that are happening in the Gulf that we will I think we're talking about maybe decades before the problem before we'll know really years, what's happening. For sure. yeah. Years before we really know what's happening there. We, we know what all the economic effects are. The thing that was so fascinating to me was just to have people 
It was the fact that this happened in the U.S. So you have the U.S. media all of a sudden looking at something that was happening 5,000 feet below the surface on the seabed floor of the Gulf of Mexico. And that was absolutely amazing to me. That was happening. And, and what I haven't quite seen yet, um, from my perspective in Canada and you know, monitoring stuff, is, is that it hasn't yet become the metaphor that it needs to become to really have traction. So it, 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 it was still, because it was also new, and there was such a high level, a uh, you know, high degree of technicality involved with it, and because the science is so unknown on, on how this stuff, how this is happening, it hasn't yet you know, become the metaphor for how we are ruining our life support system on the planet. I mean, Bob knows, and I'm sure many people in this room know that they got that, that blowout happened right beside you know, one, one of the, the second largest dead zone um, in the coastal area of, of the global ocean, which is in the Gulf of Mexico and has been there for decades. We actually have ways to deal with that, and, and we haven't done that yet. But that, you know, because it is a disaster, it hasn't happened. We haven't yet been able to use that, sort of connect the dots between this huge blow on the bottom of the seabed floor to the fact that, you know, if you actually, I mean, this is a controversial, you know, scientific point, but it's possible that that blowout actually did less damage to the global ocean by being, you know, you know, spewed out into the, into the Gulf of Mexico than it w would have done to the Gulf of Mexico, to the, to the global ocean had it been pumped up and burned as normal and acidified the ocean. I mean, that's a legitimate scientific point to investigate. As part of, I mean, we're in an era, you know, scientifically, when every, every molecule of carbon dioxide counts. And, it's, and that mo those molecules are entering the surface of the, of the ocean after, after they've been burned as fossil fuels and acidifying the ocean. So the effects in that region um, were intense. And the public would get that point. They would get that. They would get that the, point. That versus this. You but know, it's, so, it, it, it's so unimaginable. Like it's almost, you know, I've, I've talked about that a little bit to, to, to people, and it's, it's so unimaginable that it could actually do less damage there in the water than <laughs> and put into the atmosphere, put carbon into the atmosphere, that people almost go into a shutdown mode. Because we've been so conditioned to understand that this is a disaster, which of course it is. But it's just, it's just that, you know, taking it to that other level of what we're doing to the ocean as a, life, a major life support system on the planet. You know, I have, that's what I would, I would love to see that somehow happen, and it cannot happen unless we're doing somehow on the level of, I think, metaphor, which this one, this one is just a metaphor for how BP is screwing up the planet and wants laws and, and all that kind of stuff. But it hasn't become, oh my god, the dependence on oil or our economy is really that piece hasn't been put together into the planet, I think. And until it is, you know, I don't think we'll have the kind of full buy-in on, or not buy-in, but full, the, the real level, the deep level of engagement that we call it, that we carry this I've got a question going out of your comment. Because what you're talking about here is the acute disaster versus the slow motion. That's correct. Okay. And what, what, what I was trying to suggest earlier when I was talking about the visible versus the invisible pollution today, it's the same problem. Um, and what we're getting in the oil spill is a repeat of what we saw in the 1970s, the Santa Barbara spill, the Cuyahoga River, and so on and so forth. So it's not reaching that large that large. My question would be, we're only going to get to that, it seems to me, if we improve this nexus between science and drugs. And I have a question for you, uh, Bob, and for the Metcalf Institute and the Grantham Foundation. Uh, and, that, and, that is, and that is this. Are there any instances on American campuses where the science department sits down with the media department while kids are in school, undergraduate or graduate, and while teachers are teaching, and start talking about how the scientists can communicate better, this and the next generation of scientists can communicate better with the next generation of journalists. I was an on-campus <coughs> at the University of Washington, and I tried to provoke this. Uh, I got an invitation from the science department and the media department to go speak at the Poison Water. And I said, I'll come and speak if you guys will agree to meet with each other. Yeah. I don't want to just go to the media department and then go to the biology department, but I would like to see whether or not you can't get the environmental scientists and the biologists and the communications people together. 
Uh, they're never going to do it in an academic setting, but they agreed to meet at the faculty club. <laughs> this is an over the drink kind of thing. And I was nasty about it. I wouldn't let them go. And I said, well, will you guys set up a course? Could you, could you do something? Even a summer program. Could you do it with your graduate students? And they, you know, I was enough of a pain in the neck when they said, yeah, they would. But they didn't. In fact, when I got to six weeks later, I don't understand how we're going to bridge this gap unless people in both disciplines, the journalists get over the fear and the ignorance, and the scientists get over the, 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 their timidity but also reasonable caution to talk to people, and that becomes part of how you communicate, that, there's, that there is something between publishing and saying nothing. <coughs> I, I wonder whether that institution, and the reason I asked the Metcalf Institute and Grantham Foundation, is this something you all could sponsor and get, get going? Because it seems to me if you could do it on a few campuses, somewhere, the University of Rhode Island and elsewhere, yeah. people might actually find this a usable model. That, that, that's a great, great question. I'm not aware of campuses that are doing that. We certainly do not do it at Cornell. And you know, institutions tend to be fairly conservative entities. We, we have these little silos built up. There, there is some uh, effort that with Ecological Society of America runs a really great training program called the Leadership of the Future. Right? And they take sort of mid-level uh, associate professors, new full professors, uh, isolate them for two weeks at a time with both political leaders and media leaders and teach them a little bit of political skill and backgrounds and, and try to teach them a little bit of uh, savvy in terms of communicating with the press. It's also sort of a peer to peer thing. It's a way for the community. It's been going on since uh, 1999. And now there are probably you know, 600 ecologists who've gone through that training. I uh, went through those months. Uh, and in addition to the training, it's a great peer to peer thing. We encourage one another to be a little older within the confines of our rotation. We have to be cautious because, you know, if you say things are so garbage and proven garbage, you're going to get blasted. And, it's the end of your career as a scientist, but right? so you have to be cautious. And yet, the scientific community at this point is so alarmed at, at the way the environment is, is being degraded that you know, I think we have a different ethic that we have to be more proactive to it as a community. We, we say that. I, I can cite a precedent that would show that it's not so out of the as you might think. At Chapel Hill, we have a course in medical journalism. It's taught by a physician who's on our journalism faculty. In addition to being a physician, he covered medicine for a television station on the West Coast. And that came about because somebody gave the school money to endow a chair in medical journalism. So all that has to be done is to endow a chair for the department of other science and journalism. That's the easiest way to influence universities. Without a doubt. Grantham Foundation seems to exist on, on this boundary. And uh, it isn't overly encouraging. We have a, a special relationship with Imperial College London. Uh, we funded an institute for climate research. And uh, they have enormously uh, good intentions. And they're brilliant scientists and they're well respected. But they have a complete breadth of uh, overstepping the mark in, uh, in what I like to call propaganda, in communication. And uh, other than a couple of Jim Hansons who you know, will bite the bullet and show some passion and leadership, they just can't bring themselves to do it. On the other hand, we have a relationship with one school of economics, a similar one, and that, that is led by a remarkable guy, <coughs> Nick Stern, who's an economist, and actually uh, do have some advantages in this context, and uh, he and his cohort will, will get out there and represent uh, even hard science on climate change, and they will slap it on the table and fight back a little. Um, but, it's, but it's a real uphill struggle. And the worst crime, no, the worst crime is faking your data, right? Uh, the second worst crime is overstating your data. And I like to tease the scientists by saying, Normally, it's dangerous to overstate, but in climate change, it's dangerous to understate. And, and they're understating all the time. And the bad guys are out there representing their understatements as overstatements. This is not a bad guy. I just wanted to make one quick point about the fact that there actually are some schools around the country that do have um, an 
environmental uh, journalism programs that bridge the gap, at least in part, between science and journalism. Um, this is actually something that sadly is not increasing in, <laughs> in um, frequency um, right now, although there, I have to say, are conversations going on at this university to do just this sort of thing because, in fact, there is a need for, as we all know, for much better um, understanding between journalists and scientists. Sorry, I'm going to go right here and I'll put you again. So very quick. Uh, but there is, or there was, uh, one uh, graduate school that offered a joint earth sciences journalism degree. It was the best journalism school in the country, uh, many people in the country of Columbia. Uh, however, uh, looking at the newspaper business and the journalism field, it recently dissolved or terminated that activity, at least for the time being, because frankly, there's no place for its graduates to go. Fortunately, Patty, uh, Patty Carson and her group uh, will soon benefit from one of its graduates, the producer they just hired to work with, uh, Miles O'Brien, is a graduate from the, the combined uh, master's degree program in sciences and journalism. Um, Bob made the, the point about the need for journalists to be um, more proactive and less reactive. And, and there's one case in point I want to particularly ask Peter about this. There was a publication that, in fact, um, for some years um, laid out exactly what was going to happen uh, in the Gulf of Mexico um, when a particular uh, sort of storm came to the Gulf. Um, and, and, and almost to, with, with frightening precision, laid out uh, Hurricane Katrina uh, several years in advance, and that was the New Orleans Times Picayune. Um, my sense was that it didn't get a whole lot of traction uh, with its readers necessarily, or, or with a lot of people uh, who could have, who might have done something like that. Um, so it's a two part question. One is um, did you do the same sort of proactive reporting? Um, water drilling uh, in advance. And then secondly, just talk about your challenges and frustrations in, in trying to get the kind of drilling. Um, uh, we, um, I, I would not say, I wouldn't say it was completely accurate to say that the reporting um, that predicted Katrina or that predicted <coughs> catastrophic failure in a hurricane didn't get a lot of traction with readers. I think it mostly just didn't get a lot of traction with the rest of the country. Um, and, and I think one of the reasons for that, and again, this speaks to sort of the weakness of, of journalism in covering science, is that one of the ways that weakness expresses itself is in the ability of journalists to convey to Americans the relative seriousness of threats. And you see this all the time. I think the way that journalists convey threats is much more influenced by, you know, PR people and, um, and trial lawyers than often it is by scientists. And so uh, the things that Americans are afraid of are almost, and, and I forget to mention that poll, are entirely out of proportion to the things that really imperil us. Um, and I think that's a failure of, of journalism as much as anything else, but also a failure of, of science. Um, and, and the way that expresses itself in, in terms of a natural disaster is, is this, that after September 11th, um, when they formed the Department of Homeland Security, you know, all the smart or relatively smart people who were involved in that um, spent a lot of time deciding that what, now that we have a new Department of Homeland Security, what are the real serious threats to America? And they decided that there were three um, threats to America, and one was, I think, an earthquake in California, and one was a terrorist attack of some kind in New York or Washington, and the other, and the third was, um, you know, a category five or three, depending on how you view it, hurricane hitting New Orleans. Um, and, uh, and by logic, that would have somehow governed the way the nation prepared itself for a disaster. But I don't think most people knew that happened. And in our political system, you know, that's all fine, but the senator from Rhode Island wants you know, new radios for the Cranston Police Department. And, and that's what he wants, and he's doing his job in wanting that. And some of those people came down and helped in Katrina and used those radios. So the radios were, in some ways, money well spent. But I don't think journalism has done a good job, in, on any level, in portraying to the American people what are the real threats they face that they should concentrate on and, 
and pour their resources. And I would say, you know, I, I think it was one of the points that, that you made earlier, too, is that if journalism reacts, the government also reacts in terms of their legislation. It follows events, it follows things that happen. And so I think the country as a whole is not good at sort of looking at things before they occur, thinking about the implications that might happen uh, if. And I'd be curious to know, um, Dan, if we can steal your uh, brain for just another minute, on what kind of effect you have seen from the series of work that you did, um, you know, at the local level, and, and covering a story that I think probably wasn't something that was highly talked about in the community before you started covering it, and was not, you know, tied to one specific event, but is a slower moving. Well, I, I don't think I can claim any great effect from my own personal work. I think it's, it has it has pushed things forward. The biggest challenge has been to get people to understand what's going on beneath the surface of the water that 98% of the people who live on the western shore of Lake Michigan probably never venture out beyond a quarter mile, if that. So um, I think the people in Wisconsin know a lot more about their precious natural resource that is Lake Michigan. And I don't know what's going on in Cleveland. But you did get some kind of positive public well, response in terms of you interest know, and knowledge. Talking about not letting a good crisis go to waste, I think, much like the oil spill is focusing people on some of these issues, the Asian carp um, have done a lot to get people to care about this concept of open doors to waste. So uh, there is, I would say, in the last five years, there is a heightened awareness of the uh, vulnerability frailty of the lakes, uh, how that's been manifested in legislation or rulemaking. Um, things are moving forward. Uh, and we have recently passed a, a Great Lakes Compact, which is a totally separate issue, governing diversions of water outside the Great Lakes space. Uh, the eight Great Lakes states banded together and basically said, we can't take any water out of the lake. And that was a remarkable uh, demonstration of cooperation regionally. And that came from, from media coverage, from the Milwaukee Journal Central, but from a lot of other papers as well. So it's all a matter of just, I think, what I'm covering is just it's educating people, but to get them to the point where they can. Yeah. Yeah, on the topic of relative threats that Peter talked about, Amy, you said the job is to make the boring interesting, and maybe the job is also to make the important interesting. And so there was another catastrophic failure. And that uh, may, I would say, most assuredly have a greater impact, and that was Copenhagen. And so based on the coverage of deep water and what worked and what didn't work, is there a way that the blowout preventer in Copenhagen could have been covered in a way that it, it, it connected with people about what was at stake and what was an opportunity that was missed and what were the consequences. Because that seemed to be a very important issue that was just peripheral and died almost in childbirth. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 this, and those, those, you know, those, the 
those emails were cherry picked, and <laughs> they still couldn't come up with anything that was really very significant. But somehow the media, um, you know, we bought this for that polis bolus as an as a, as a institution. We bought that somehow there was something wrong in what the scientists had done, not in, you know, the the uh, you know the, uh, the, the, the something launching a spy thing for religions. But forgetting about the emails, I mean the impact on the environment and human health of losing three or four or five years, however many, is going to dwarf what happened in course, the Gulf. Of, of course, that's, that's correct. I mean, we, we now know that we're locked into at least two degrees, probably much more than two degrees. We're, gonna hit, we're at 333, 393 right now, part per million by volume of CO2 in the atmosphere. And we know that we're going to hit, what, 450? At 450, what do they say? Something like 20%, as many as 20% of species on the planet will go extinct. 20%. If we hit 560, which is a doubling of the pre-industrial levels, there as many as 70% of the species on the planet could go extinct. Um, I, I don't know if this is true, but I heard um, Antarctica is growing. The, the shelf is growing. And I heard that um, in California it's been the you know, coldest um, 100 years for a decade. So how do you respond to that? And um, also those emails weren't, some of the, the correspondence in those emails, didn't they say something about holding back some uh, studies that revealed that, that um, climate um, was not actually going up, that there was some evidence to show that global, global warming was not necessarily the case? I mean, there is a dialogue here that I feel like so yeah, totally more. Can I respond to that just as a scientist who works on global change as well? I mean, the, the scientific consensus, I think, the scientific consensus on global change is, is overwhelming. You can find an occasional scientist. We have one on the Cornell faculty. There's 1,300 of Cornell, one guy who doesn't believe in global climate change. The rest of us do. The, the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change 2007 report, it's a cautiously worded thing because we scientists are cautious, but it is a damning thing. And this letter I showed you from the Council of Scientific Society presidents, that's 1.4 million of the U.S. scientists. We feel a strong urgency to get on and solve global warming in the community. I'm really hard pressed to find a scientist who doesn't think that. Now you can find local spots where you have to have a little cooler here or there, there's a lot of climatic variability, and some of us have started to talk about global climate disruption as opposed to just warming because we're changing things, you know, but we are changing it and the data behind that are, are overwhelming. On the email, you know, we, we, scientists are people and we communicate a lot by email. It's a global enterprise now. I work with colleagues on a daily basis in Brazil and China and things and we, we do that by email and I'm sure if you cherry picked my emails you could find, you know, something where I use a bad word to you. <laughs> but I can also assure you that the scientific process whereby we finally get out and publish our results and we put out reports, you know, there's, there's, it's, a, it's an ultra clean thing. We're not easily bought. The system is, is pretty, pretty damn good. And that doesn't mean that we don't communicate kind of, you know, what do you think about, you know, that study? It's, it's got some real flakiness of this, you know, should someone try to delve further into the data and look at it again. Yeah, that's, that's the sound kind of communication we have behind the scenes all the time. So I'm going to pull everybody back just a little bit to uh, the topic that we were addressing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, and to just say just a little bit uh, into the future, not too far, in the next six months or so, I mean, what are the plans for continued coverage? What happens now? What are the questions that you ask? And I, I would imagine that there's a different perspective at the local level than at the national level. Well, it's, it's a real challenge right now. As I said, we were very equal to September. <laughs> we, did, we did do two pieces in September, but it wasn't the kind of constant. Um, and we are very, very, very fortunate that as of, um, after, after a couple of months of it, I um, talked to Valentine Cass from the NSF and told her what we were doing, and we were encouraged to apply for a rapid grant and got one. And that's just critical and crucial for being able to not only be able to keep our staff going and keep covering it, but also now we have to keep covering it. So do you have a certain number of reporters, producers, um, dedicated to covering the spill in the next several months? We haven't, yeah. We, we've had the scheme that's, it's, it'll rotate a little bit because people are moving out to cover politics, but the correspondent that 
has been and will, will, will continue <laughs> well rested <laughs> vacation is actually exhausted, um, we'll go back uh, to the Gulf and do more work. But the problem we've had is everything seems right now incremental in terms of the science. So what's happening to the fish? We sort of reported that. Is, is it enough to get my boss to say, okay, go for another beast because it's this much more, or the microbial action, um, dispersants. So a lot of things aren't happening now. So we are trying to figure out what we do next. And I was talking to about uh, looking at the engineering kind of aspects of what went wrong with that well and what it should have been doing, and also looking at what the, the coalition of uh, oil companies are doing to say how this will happen in the future. So we're trying to sort of broaden our perspective on what we can look at so, so we can keep, keep looking at the research. And then hopefully some of the people, some of the scientists that got the rapid grants right at the beginning will start to have their data. So that's one question I was going to ask. Is there you know, data <coughs> scientists that may be out and be available that then can help tell us? I think that's really what helps us uh, to, go back, um, yeah. to go back at certain aspects of things we've already covered. And I know the whole thing with the gen next generation of fish is still a lot of looking at things of that kind of So people may say the fish is fine to eat now, but don't eat their babies. <laughs> and then it gets very emotional with the, the fishermen down there. And, and that's a lot of like the anecdotal and the emotional kind of thing. Okay, my husband's a fisherman, he's sick, or my husband's a fisherman, he can't work. And you get into the human drama of it and trying to separate out people who say one thing versus what's the reality of it, the scientific reality of all of the shrimp birds. Right. On the local level, are you, uh, how much of your news are you devoted to the oil spoon? Um, well, still, still quite a bit. You know, there, there's, I was thinking there's two kind of people in the world. You know, there's people who eat fish and there's people Worry about mercury and fish. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody fits in one category or the other. Um, and, and New Orleans are people, overwhelmingly people who eat fish and don't work. Um, but there's a lot of local interests um, still in the science, um, perhaps for the less than altruistic reason that so much of the economy is now tied up, you know, tied up in the science. And um, you know, I think what local people hope the science proves is that the fish are safe to eat, so that um, so that the word can get out and they can, you know, they can restore their business. Did you actually get pushback from readers if stories came out you know, in your paper saying the fish may not be safe to eat? Did you have to deal with that? Um, yeah, I, you know, one thing I learned learned um, from Katrina was that readers really expect you, particularly in the internet age where people all over the country kind of look at your website, especially the media looks at your website to see what's going on, that people really expect you to tell, um, you know, to tell their story. And, and in this case, the story that they want told is that it's safe to eat the fish again and, you know, ignore all those negative scientists mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, and, you know, don't worry about the dispersants, it's just detergent anyhow stuff like that. And so it's kind of a balance between, um, you know, the fact that that story does want to get told and, and the dispersants are really detergent. The question is whether it was too much detergent. And, um, and on the other hand, you know, the fact that, that readers want a, you know, a sober perspective on it. And I think over time, you know, science, this is going to be the most studied thing ever. There's so much money to study this thing that I think you'll be finding out, there'll be scientific studying of this thing, and you'll be finding out things about this oil spill for years to come. Um, I think the challenge for, you know, the challenge for journalists is that you'll find that, that the studies will produce conflicting things. They already are. There are scientists who think there are plumes, and there are scientists who think there aren't plumes. There are, you know, as you mentioned, there are scientists who say the bottom of the Gulf is covered with oil, and there are scientists who say it isn't covered. And uh, journalists just aren't in a very good position to know how to sort all that out, other than just quoting both sides, which is you know the same technique we use to <coughs> the election side. Well, and I'd say part of what um, you know we see happening at a broader level in the news industry is um, that the role of the journalist is changing a little bit um, as as um, as in complicated stories and as the public gets more comfortable with parsing through information themselves. And that um, there's also a lot more of partnering that's happening. That as journalistic organizations have had to cut way back and not be able to try to have reporters that know about everything, they're looking for ways to partner with experts that know an area that they can't be experts in. 
um, which certainly leads to an opening to developing some kind of relationship with the scientific community. And to then being able to give your public, here are the three views from three leading scientists. They're all different. Take a look at it. See what you think. Um, that, that the public is comfortable doing that, and they want to do that. Um, not only uh, are they able to, but they, but they want to. And so it certainly seems that, um, you know, with all the negative impact that the economy and, and, and other things have had on the news industry, there certainly are some opportunities there for creating new relationships and looking for new ways to tell these stories. So just one, one, one thing I don't think we as a scientific community have done well at all is to try to help synthesize the information as we go along. But you're right, there are people who think there's a flu in the future who don't think. And there are good reasons for that. And you can probably get the people who think both of that together and reach a consensus as to you know, where the real difference is. You're not seeing it. It's just being argued out in the press. Yeah. But we as a scientific community perhaps have a better mechanism for doing that. But we need to have the buy-in from the press to, to do that. They do that with the uh, amount of oil leaking question, well, yeah. where you really you had a, uh, you know you you had it, it started out as a you know we can quote one guy saying this and another guy saying that and ultimately right. they reach you know something of a consensus estimate right the high and low are about fifty percent apart but they're, they're well, that's that's <laughs> 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 uh, you know I just want to the barrels and challenges I just want to make a point about this panel. Um, because I'm, I'm actually finding myself coming at it in an upside down kind of way. It's really fascinating that actually what I'm walking away from here is that the press did a really good job on this story. Scientists were incredibly engaged and did a good job of communicating overall. And the public was incredibly engaged in the story as your research shows. So on all three fronts, things were working. However, um, to pick up on Alana's point about the metaphor hasn't kicked in, not only has it not kicked in, we're now starting to hear about how the effects weren't so bad, and what's happening in California is a perfect example of how we don't seem to have learned a lesson at how important regulation is. So, my, 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 point, my point here is that um, something's missing. And we're putting a lot of weight on the scientific community to step up, and the press. But it seems to me that what we've learned just out of, out of the Gulf issue is that the environmental activists have dropped the ball. They have not done a good job of moving forward on marketing things like this and saying, we have a huge problem. And it's not the role of the press to do that, and it's not the role of a scientist to do that. So uh, what I'm walking away from here is that actually we want the press to do more than it should, and we want scientists to do more than they should. I throw that out there. Because I think environmentalists really need to step up with a great deal more urgency. Well, you guys have all been left out. No, that, that would, I mean, from the point of view of the journalist, that would really cut it. Um, you know, just because an environmentalist becomes you know, an activist becomes more impassioned about something and tries to get the message across in a bigger way doesn't mean that that person is necessarily going to get any more coverage. Or that we, you know, well, we have a, you know, the, there's a huge discount factor within environmental activists when you're trying to cover that person or, or that person's views for mainstream media. I mean, it just, there are, I could count it on the fingers of, you know, one hand the times I've ever quoted an environmental activist, no matter how well informed or how impassioned. Mm -hmm. That person was because it isn't. It doesn't resonate with readers. So, and I think I disagree slightly about about the role of, of journalists and scientists. I mean, our jobs as journalists and scientists are to to capture the implications and the, the significance of events. So, like when I was doing my book, I, you know, part of my job was to was to do as a journalist what scientists couldn't necessarily do, which was to talk about the implications and the significance to the global ocean of the pool. And, and I was able to do that because I am a journalist. I was able to take that, that big view of it and, and ask the questions that the scientists couldn't necessarily discuss. Um, so I, I, think, I don't think it is up to the environmental activists. I think that that's a, a sector that has, I, I really hate to say this, but I, I think that's a sector that has squandered its credibility over time. But weren't you talking about not the nexus of 
yeah. environmental activists in the press. Right. You were talking about the nexus of environmental act activists in the political process, right? right? And, right. and exactly. your action. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's, that's, I don't know how that works here. <laughs> <laughs> say journalists would be mostly reluctant to say they have a solution or that here is the solution. 